Hello, and welcome to Monumental, where we sit down with entrepreneurs, leaders, visionaries, and big thinkers making monumental change. Here's your host, Evan Holliday. Welcome to Monumental. I'm your host, Evan Holliday, and today we have on have with us in the studio here, uh, Miss Meg Epstein. Meg, how are you doing? Good, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes, I'm so glad to have you here. Uh, so glad to finally meet in person and excited for today's show. So a little bit about Meg before we get started. Uh, she offers unparalleled ex- expertise and resources to real estate investors, developers, and strategic partners with a decade of hard-won results in luxury residential real estate developing everything from celebrity homes in Bel Air to luxury wine country retreats in Napa Valley to mid-rise condos along Nashville's waterfront. That's pretty amazing. (laughs) I'm excited to get into that. Uh, And then over the course of her career, she's been involved in development and construction of over 1 million square feet of residential and commercial real estate, representing over $780 million to date. That is a pretty dang big number. (laughs) So I'm excited. Uh, she's also a licensed commercial contractor, residential contractor, CCIM con- candidate, and licensed real estate agent. She also keeps a private pilot's license and bareboat charter <laughs> sailing certification. Uh, that's really cool. Um, so quick side note, let's just dive right into that real quick. What what inspired you to want to get your pilot's license and your bareboat sailing yeah, certification? I actually got my pilot's license when I was 16. So it was my senior project in wow. high school. Yeah. So I've had it a long time. It's come in handy. Um, now I have some investors that have planes. So it's kind of a good you know, <laughs> point of reality so, yeah. to talk with them. And, um, you know, I obviously don't have my own plane, but I can go up with them, which is fun. Um, I don't make it up nearly enough anymore, but, you know, I plan to probably later in life when I'm not so busy. <laughs> I love it. And the sailing's great. My husband's a big sailor. So we, we go several times a year. That's awesome. Yeah. It's amazing to, to get outdoors and and get up in the sky and get out on the water. Yeah, especially this last year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, well, let's dive right into a little bit of your background and, and kind of tell our monumental listeners how you got to where you are today. Sure. So um, I, when I was in school at UCLA, I was going to be a financial analyst, which is kind of the typical route. But I graduated in 2008 and I spent senior year in Barcelona and realized that I just really loved architecture and I wasn't super um, excited about going back to, you know, my first job and being an analyst and just living in spreadsheets. So uh, I got a job by um, going by some job sites in Bel Air, which was near my school, obviously. So I got hired as a project manager and put on the the job sites with a bunch of, you know, like 50 guys every day and eating (laughs) out of a Mexican food truck for lunch and did the whole. That's awesome. Yeah. And I really learned a lot about construction and how things are built and civil engineering and, and, you know, important fundamentals, I think. Um, And then when the market started to change in 2012, that was in Los Angeles, I moved to San Francisco and started doing my own developments um, with a few partners again, in high end residential. And, but these, you know, these sites were, you know, these are 10, 20, up to $60 million homes. So, Hmm. um, almost commercial size and actually a lot more complicated than a, (laughs) than a typical building. Wow. So when I moved here, I realized that that wasn't going to be a good business model because there's not $20 million homes here. So (laughs) there's a few, but not as many as on the West Coast. Yeah. So I did the CCIM certification mm-hmm. program and I really am a fundamental believer in that. Um, it's very practical. It, it just kind of runs you through all the different types of commercial real estate and decided to focus on condos just because for my own use, I was looking for, you know, my husband and I moved from California and I didn't really see a lot of inventory that I liked. A lot of it was a lot older. And I thought, gosh, there's not really like a middle market Obviously, now you have the Four Seasons and all these amazing you yeah. know, buildings, but there wasn't really a middle market affordable luxury product. And so I originally focused on that. And then um, after I got started, Opportunity Zone legislation came out. And so I set up a few Opportunity Zone funds and just kind of look at the market and listen to to brokers about what's really undersupplied and, and kind of stuck to those niches and kind of developed my own platforms based hmm. on what was 
really undersupplied in the market. So that's ended up being this sort of affordable luxury, either apartments or condos, as well as um, industrial flex office. So, yeah. That's really cool. It seems like each step of the way, you're continually growing and taking massive leaps uh, in what you're doing and what you're learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, always. <laughs> and, and so going back to kind of the beginning, because I didn't know the scale or the magnitude of which you were building custom homes. Uh, I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty amazing building 10, $20 million homes. Yeah, I was really lucky to get a job in that, especially in 2008, because there were so many construction professionals that were out of work. Um, but, you know, I work for a very unconventional um, general contractor. And what I realized was that the, the principles that I use now in commercial real estate and looking at something as an investment and marrying that with someone's custom home where they're, you know, living with their wife and kids and, mm -hmm. um, and having to manage a project and a schedule was something that was kind of rare because these people, you know, I mean, this is their custom home and, and they're spending, you know, $50 million maybe on, you know, on, on their house. Wow. And, um, it took a lot of various consultants and budgeting. And I mean, t one house would have, you know, now maybe I have a structural engineer and an architect and the typical players, but you know, on uh, something like that, you had, I had, you know, beehive consultants and, you know, Christmas tree lighting consultants <laughs> and the Lakers, oh you know, the guy that does the Lakers consulting on the gym for the, you know, yeah. like just all these crazy characters. So wow. it kind of gave me a really good background in working with people and understanding, you know, budgets and schedules. And so that's interesting. I, it's actually yeah. a lot easier what I do now. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say like, you're dealing with a very emotional client mm -hmm. and a very particular client that is very specific in their vision. And yeah. sometimes they don't always know what they want or or don't transition that over to what you know getting that information to you right um, i was very lucky my first client or the client you know i was working for um he was a real estate developer himself and he made a lot of you know money in real estate development um actually in mobile homes randomly and he was like <laughs> living in this french chateau in bel-air but he taught me a lot he was a very down-to-earth guy self-made accountant lawyer and he just taught me a lot about insurance and building and and so he kind of mentored me a little bit which was great how did you find your way uh into each phase of like going into uh building 50 million dollar homes and then and then also above and beyond that like finding your way into these new spaces and finding mentors how did you go about that yeah well once I got to Nashville, I mean, people are so friendly here. Um, I don't think I could have done or scaled up nearly as much as I have in an environment like California. So I think for me, like when I've gone and launched a vertical or tried to do a new asset class, I've found um, the right, I've assembled the right team. And mm -hmm. so um, when I first started, Jared Bradley is a local architect here and he was from California and we had a very similar design aesthetic. We still do. We have a lot of projects mm -hmm. going together, but he was a design builder and, you know, I was able to work with him and he understood a lot that I didn't. And that kind of, um, you know, launched the beginning of how I understood commercial real estate investment. And then, and just coupling that with, you know, what I learned in CCIM and then, I did the same thing on the industrial. I partnered with a much more experienced developer in industrial when I first started that platform. And that kind of gave me the leverage to, you know, understand the asset class and then build from there. So what, what was your first project, your first commercial project? So you move out to Nashville, um, you've decided you want to get into commercial. What was that first project and how did that come about? Sure. So I was living in Germantown with my husband at Worthen Locks and I'd run a lot along the river and I thought, gosh, why is there just nothing on the river in Nashville? Mm -hmm. and, I, and, you know, you talk to local people and they thought, well, no one wants to live on the river yeah. in Nashville. And I'm like, well, I'm from San Francisco. No one yeah. wants to be on the water. It is weird. Side note, it's like every every building in Nashville, like faces away from the river. I know. I know. And I thought, you know, you go to cities like Chicago and it's like, pretty inevitable that yeah. that is going to be desirable at some point. Like someone's going to want an urban environment, but to be facing the water. So, um, I found a site on a run again, which is how I got my first <laughs> job. So I'm not a huge runner, but I always like, you know, kind of getting, getting my space by mm -hmm. running. And, 
Um, I found a site that said for sale by owner and it was on the water. And um, I met the guy and he was a developer kind of um, that had designed a project and he basically needed funding for it. So I was like, oh, I can get you funding for it. And I didn't, you know, I didn't have any contacts (laughs) or any money or anything, but I kind of had to wing that and figured it out. And um, anyways, it did end up being a bit of a disaster. But um, the long story short was that I ended up buying him out. And, I, you know, I always, I always loved finance and it's still my favorite thing is raising capital and putting the capital stack together. But inevitably, you know, when you do that, you have to be responsible for the asset because these are your investors. And so I ended up taking over that project and um, I had to redesign it because of costs and, and whatnot. It's actually finally being built now. <laughs> it's almost done. <laughs> I'm so excited. And it's going to be, I think, very well received. Um, but that was my very first project. And I kind of just kind of had to figure out the development aspect because I had invested in it and, you know, needed to make it go right. So, um, that was my first foray. And then, um, but while that was happening, I was, you know, building more relationships and I, I completed the Illum condos, which is a 77 unit condo building in the South Gulch neighborhood. And, Again, I just kind of looked at Nashville and I looked at where the trendy neighborhoods were, Wedgwood, Houston, downtown, the Gulch, and looked, try to connect the dots for what's in between there and go, okay, well, obviously these neighborhoods are going to close in at some point. Yeah. So, and I wasn't trying to sell, you know, Gulch prices. So I um, kind of stuck to that, again, middle, middle market that's a walkable and had, you know, appealed to the millennial demographic. Um, my style is very modern and that, and that worked out well in that first project. And, um, you know, I had some great partners to help me get that out of the ground and it was very successful and profitable. So just kind of went from there. (laughs) I love that. Um, first off, I love that it started with a run, uh, (laughs) and just seeing a a sign. I I do that all the time. I'm like running, biking, um, driving around, literally just snapping pictures of for sale signs or even just pieces of land. Yeah. I'm sure you do the same thing. I do. I don't think a lot of people, I, you know, I hate to say like that millennials are too stuck in their phones, but you know, there is something to just observing your environment mm-hmm. and, and yeah. getting a sense and walking neighborhood and, you know, yeah. Yeah, exactly. I mean, um, so I, I know the location you're talking about, your development on the river. Uh, it's, it's a really unique location. And I think you're right. I, I love how you bring up, like, you know, you, you saw downtown, you saw Germantown, you saw that they were going to inevitably connect at some point and create a more interconnected, walkable, uh, livable area, part of town. And so I love that you saw that and you said, okay, how can we be right there in the, in the path of progress? Right. Uh, and, and also put ourselves at a, you know, a nice, well-designed development that is, you know, attractive to millennials and offers the river and offers something where they can be next to the goal or next to Germantown and next to downtown. Yeah. You can Um, walk to the stadium, you can walk to Broadway, but you know, that idea was very, I had to really fight for that because there was a jail, there's bail bond places around. And since then the jail was moved and, you know, like, but you have to kind of be a little ahead of, you know, look where the puck is going. Yeah. And um, usually by the time, you know, it's, it, you know, if you're in the Gulch, it's, you're yeah. not going to get any deal, you know, yep. if you're trying to build in the Gulch now. But um, I've learned that just from, you know, I've had great partners that have, that have sort of taught me that lesson. And how, I mean, I love the fact that you were like, I can help with the financing. Like I can do that. Uh, and, and and I think that honestly, that's a great lesson for our listeners because I mean, there's a lot of been a lot of times where I've had to do the same where it's like, you just have to have confidence and belief in yourself that, and, and express that belief to whoever you're potentially partnering with or a landowner and saying, Hey, I can get that done. Like yeah. I, I like internally, I don't exactly know how that's going to happen, but I right. know I can do it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. People, I think you can be a little too logical sometimes and that, but if you know, I mean, it, to me, it was a no brainer. I just saw that obviously this was going to be successful. So I was like, yeah. oh, I, I can figure this out, but you know, I didn't start with any family connections in it or, you know, money. <laughs> so it was, <laughs> it was a lot of cold calling, <laughs> but yeah. it was good. So so working with that landowner saying, hey, I can help with financing. 
um, the the process to, to actually getting that development over the finish line. Um, it sounds like it, it took a lot of cold calling relationships, asking questions, figuring out what you didn't know and, and mm-hmm. how to solve for that. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of that. Um, and it, and when it, that project, when I first started was more of a syndication, like more like what you do. And since then I moved away from that and I only work with more institutional private equity. So I don't syndicate any mm-hmm. money anymore. Um, which is easier for me. It's not, you know, I think syndicating is like, so it, to me, it's like such a, <laughs> a huge undertaking. And, um, cause just because I look back on how much work that is, but, but yeah, that was how I originally started. That's great. Um, and, and as far as where you're, like you mentioned, like you, you have a modern design, uh, a, a, you, you build in the aesthetic into the building and that's part of what attracts your, your clients, your buyers to your, your condo developments. How did that, like, why is that important to you? I think it, um, I think it has to just do with me being from California and really loving, I mean, everyone thinks they have a good taste, right? But I, I just really loved modern design. Um, as I said, I spent my senior year in Barcelona and I, I started appreciating, um, architecture a lot more and, I think that Nashville, you know, there's still a lot of room in that regard and people can be pretty unimaginative. And so I wanted to bridge the gap. I saw even before the pandemic, obviously there was a lot of people moving here. Now it's a mad rush, but I wanted to offer something that those people are a little more used to, um, in terms of design, but also not, you know, not be, be priced out of it. And so the result has been, um, a more modern project, you know, we, we prioritize larger windows and clean lines and you don't necessarily have to spend more, you know, to do certain finishes that look a lot more, you know, unique or modern. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just not what's being done, you know, in every Normally, single development. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. Uh, and that reminds me of one of my favorite books uh, is all about Gerald Hines. Uh, have you read that book, uh, Rising Above? I have. Yes. Uh, okay. I love Gerald Hines. Yeah. He's like, he was, I mean, when he passed away, I was like, oh my gosh. But I mean, what a full life he led. Yeah. But I, um, I read that book and it was super inspiring because I felt a little bit like where I started on 8th Avenue is kind of how, where he started mm-hmm. in Richmond Avenue in Houston and he kind of made his mark that way. And, yeah. um, it's just amazing, obviously what he ended up doing, but, um, yeah, incredible you know, development mind. Yeah. And he, like you said, I mean, he always said, he's like, I'd rather spend more time and more investment on the design of my buildings. Because at the end of the day, if you have two different buildings, you know, if they're exactly apples to apples, what separates them? Right. Uh, And the design and and the way we as people interact with that space inside Mm -hmm. and outside of a building, I think that's what ultimately can separate your developments from other developments. Yeah. And especially now, I think people even appreciate that after being in their spaces <laughs> physically all year. Yeah. Um, I think that that's even more appreciated for sure. Yeah. So you mentioned you syndicated that first deal and then now you've you've gone completely to private equity. Yeah. What, what caused that and, and what has that transition been like? Well, um, the second deal I was... I put together, um, was actually, as I mentioned, so it was a developer builder, um, Jared, he, so they'd had the deal and I thought, I think the equity check was seven or 8 million or something. And I just, I just don't have, like, I don't I didn't grow up with a country club. Like I just didn't <laughs> have, I was like, okay, that's a little bit out of my league. So I just started researching a lot online, how, mm-hmm. you know, what type of groups fund that. And it's basically, um, you know, real estate, private equity funds are the big, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and I was very lucky. I mean, it was a great timing. I think I did that raise in 2016 or 17. And so it was just the, there was already a lot of investor interest in Nashville, but Nashville really has become the darling investment Mm -hmm. market. So to have a sort of strong understanding and local presence here, but also have more of a sophisticated approach to finance, I think was a really good, um, marrying of, you know, those, like those traits so that private, you know, when I 
first started looking at deals or even the river tower deal. I mean, the pro forma was like, you know, <laughs> pathetic. <laughs> and so, <laughs> you know, if you can take that and like actually underwrite and do a 10 tab pro forma that's real and, you know, that, that communicates a lot more to more institutional players. So, um, that was kind of how I bridged that gap. And, and as far as convincing private equity to, to work with you, yeah, don't ask uh, me that. I don't know <laughs> how it, I don't know how that worked out um, in the beginning. I I just had you know I found the right person at the right time, but I I did a lot of calls. I mean, yeah. I, I cold called probably two or three hundred different groups over the wow. course of three months to find mm -hmm. to get my first deal funded, and you know, it happened to be the right group at the right time, looking yep. to invest in Nashville and kind of the right check size. Mm -hmm. Um, and now I understand a lot more what that landscape looks like. Cause I know most of the players, I mean, you have at the very top, like a, you know, a Blackstone that does, you know, wants yeah. to place $50 million in equity or a hundred million dollars or, you know, and then you have, um, you know, smaller high net worth and then you have family office and that whole spectrum. And I really didn't know what any of that was until I, kind of went through those, the lessons over the, just over the years of talking to different groups and understanding the difference between, you know, like an investment banker type broker that's going to try to bring equity versus a direct to private equity mm -hmm. deal or, you know. That's really interesting. Yeah. And I think that's a great point, which you said, calling two to 300 yeah. uh, different, either <laughs> private equity, family office, you know, whatever it was. Mm -hmm. um, that's amazing. Uh, that's a lot of work. And I think that speaks to what it takes, especially when you're getting started in anything. anything. You have to, you have to first understand what, like who your core audience is, like with the private equity, like what do they want? What are they looking for? What makes them happy? How can you make their life easier? Uh, and you only get to that level of understanding by kind of putting yourself through the ringer, like dialing for dollars, mm -hmm. making relationships, asking lots of questions. Yeah. Um, and knowing that it's not just going to hit on the first call you make or the 10th call. It may, yeah. it may take two to 300 calls. And, and the group that ended up funding my first deal, I think it was like the 10th time. And I got like, finally got through to an analyst there that doesn't work there anymore. But he was like, no, we're not interested. And I just was like, no, I think I can get the like the lead guy <laughs> interested. And I just kept calling yeah. him and like, it was on the 10th call. And he's like, fine, I guess I'll, you know, jump on a flight and head down to Nashville. And I was like, okay. And then wow. around. So it really is about perseverance. And I think that's where I see hmm. a lot of entrepreneurs just not, yeah. you know, you can maybe you're like 90% there sometimes and you just have to keep going yep. and like kind of right when you want to give up is, is kind of when you need to push through. Yeah, exactly. Um, but I do have to say that I think I probably could have fast tracked that by, you know, I have much more brilliant people working for me <laughs> now that, you know, went to business school and those type of thing. I mean, I'm sure there's, I, the way I did it was not the conventional way, right? Um, I'm sure there was ways to understand real estate finance that were a lot more conventional. I think it helped that I didn't know, you know, if I typically now, if you look at a private equity deal, okay, you want, it's a $50 million deal. You're going to have to come up with 20 million in equity. So that means if I knew that, typically I would have to come up with $2 million. So I probably would have just not even tried if I had known that, yeah. but I didn't know. <laughs> so I just, you know, but it worked out, you yeah. know what I mean? Cause I didn't have these sort of preconceived notions about what, what I need to do or be to, you know, ultimately be successful. So yeah, I do think there is a little bit of a lesson there for the listeners of just having grit and optimism. So in, in working with private equity, um, I think a lot of our listeners have probably done maybe syndications mm -hmm. uh, and they are looking at, they're considering, hey, I want to tap into larger pools of capital. Mm -hmm. um, what advice would you have? And then also, could you shed some light on like roughly how you all structure that with the private equity? Sure. I think, um, you know, the terms can vary widely, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot more conventional shops that do want you know, you to put, they, they'll bring 90% of the equity check. They want you to bring 10% as the sponsor. They want a very conventional track record, which I didn't have. <laughs> um, and I think that a really good way to segue into that is by co-GPing versus looking for an LP. Um, 
And I'm not even recommending this. I mean, it, it's good for me now because I'm trying, I'm at 500 million and at CA South, I'm working towards a billion by the end of the year. For me to get those numbers, I'm going to have to use private equity. The people that have built these syndic- you know, these high net worth relationships of loyal investors mm-hmm. that are 50, 100, $250,000 checks, it's a gr- that's a great pool. I wouldn't, you know, I don't know if I would wish <laughs> my route on anyone. I mean, I, I don't want to... Um, I don't want to debase that at all because I think that is a very successful model mm-hmm. that that comes in handy and has a lot more benefits. It's just I I just didn't happen to take that route and I like working with private equity principals versus, you know, having a hundred investors want to talk to me and, right. and understand the deal and walk them through it. I just, you know, I'm not super patient as a person. And, um, so that appealed to me a lot more. So I do just want to say like, if you are syndicating or you yeah, have that's a great point, the high net worth pool and that works for you and you can, um, you know, that, that, that is a great route. You can also do that in combination with a private equity check. If you want to bring an LP, to bring the bigger check and then, you know, in your GP as you were, mm-hmm. it just depends on what the LP is, what the group is, um, what's important to them. Some private equity doesn't care how much you have in the deal. Some it's like, no, you need to know that you're on the line and, you know, you yeah, need to have 10% have in the game, and that's, yeah. that's, you know, they don't care. So, um, I would say if someone wants to segue into private equity, a great way to do that is to do a co GP because then you have the private equity group depending on how hands-on or hands-off they want to be, they probably have quite a bit of track record. You know, maybe they'll sign on the the debt for you if you don't have a balance sheet like that, like I didn't have a balance sheet. And it kind of, you know, they'll want to share in the fees, but it's a really good way to make a leap into yeah. that space. And then eventually you can, you know, once you have enough capital and, and track record, you can just do LP capital so that they're not as involved you know, there's pluses and minuses, but I would say Koji Ping is a really great way to segue. Yeah, that's a great point. I think, you know, bringing them on board, like you said, you you tap into their experience, their knowledge. It mm-hmm. allows you to do the bigger deals um, if you don't yet have that track record. Right. Um, so you've done uh, luxury condominiums. You've done. Uh, I don't know if I call them luxury, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, what, they're, you, they're affordable luxury. Affordable yeah, luxury. No, I like yeah. I like that actually. Um, so affordable luxury condos, uh, industrial flex space and medical office. Um, is there more that I'm missing? Off- mainly just office condo. Yeah. Office, office condos. condos. It's mainly condos, like the condo model, which is a lot harder to get financed, mm-hmm. but is very in demand. A lot of people want to invest in Nashville. Isn't yeah. You know, if you are a small business owner, I mean, we talked yeah. about even yourself, like why do you want to pay a lease? You want to own your, your space. Um, and same when rents have com- cap rates have compressed and rents have gotten so high, there becomes a point for a buyer, even if you're a millennial and non-committal, where you're going, okay, I'd rather just get an, a, you know, FHA mortgage and my rent's going to be as much as my mortgage, and I own something in Nashville and it's yeah. going to keep appreciating. So it's mainly that condo niche, and then um, affordable luxury and opportunity zones. So same sort of thing, you know, maybe more boutique design, not a typical. 300 unit box that you see kind of massively milled out here. And then, um, industrial flex being, again, I saw a need because I was a developer in Nashville, moving these small businesses out of the city and they really just don't have a lot of places to go. Um, there's a lot of older inventory, but again, it's the big guys are focused on Amazon and, you know, 500,000 square foot warehouses, Mm -hmm. but where is the guy that's the HVAC contractor that I just bought his, building, he has plenty of money because I just paid him 10 times what he paid for it. <laughs> and he wants to go, you know, he can't be too far from Nashville. Yeah. But he just needs, you know, maybe 10 or 15 or 20,000 square feet. And so, you know, even in some cases, when I go to talk to sellers, I have a solution for them. I'm like, Hey, like, I realize that you were making plenty of money and you have a great operation, but you realize you're sitting on a gold mine. I can move you to, you know, I can yeah, move you to that's interesting. another you know, I have sort of a solution that yeah. they won't, if they have to do it themselves, they're just like, no, I'm good. Like, yeah. you know. Yeah. So I, I've had that thought before where, uh, like we've reached out to sellers similar to what you just said is like, they're like, well, you know, if we had another option, you know, something affordable, you know, we don't need to be in the middle of town. 
And then that brings up a whole nother job for me or right. my team to go out and find them some other option. Right. Uh, and that's a lot of work. But if you're saying, hey, I can find you another place, I already have another place or I'm building a place, that's a that's a phenomenal option. And it's a win win because you're now know, yeah. you have a, a client on the back end and you now have a new site to develop. Right. That's really cool. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, I, I you mentioned the, the OZ funds, the Opportunity Zone funds. Um, what for you attracted you to that and how did you go about setting that up? Well, I was doing my projects, condo, two condo projects in the South Gulch neighborhood or Gulch View, right adjacent to the Gulch. And then that was in 2018, I think the legislation came out. So those were already capitalized as condos, but it was a neighborhood that was kind of becoming my, you know, my beat. And mm -hmm. so um, once they became op zones, I realized, okay, now there's even more investment dollars. It is it is hard to get condos financed. I mean, there's only so, there's much less investors than right. multifamily or um, opportunities and investors. So um, one of the projects that we looked at as condos, we said, oh, let's do this as an opportunity zone fund instead. Hmm. And my outside general counsel was very, uh, he was on the forefront, a lot of opportunity zones. So he was able to help us set up our first fund yeah. and, you know, it wasn't any, it wasn't super hard, but it's great diversification for me because I never envisioned myself being a merchant builder. And when you sell something, it's like, okay, now I have to go find another project versus you have a 10 year hold then you're you know making fees on that we also do our own property management so we're running that for 10 years we're in charge of the asset we're getting income and it's a different type of income and so mm -hmm. it's a nice nice you know diversification yeah yeah i think that's that's an interesting way to look at it saying hey how can we tap into this new resource the federal government's incentivizing us to do it and we have capital that we can place and hold for a very long time uh for you know 10 plus years to get the OZ benefit. Mm -hmm. um, that's really cool. Yeah. Uh, so I did want to touch on uh, building out your team and, and what that process is like um, and how you've been able to find and surround yourself by an amazing team. Yeah, I'm. sometimes I pinch myself because they're <laughs> amazing and I don't know why they want to come take massive pay cuts to come work for me, but um, I'm, I did mean to touch on that when you mentioned private equity because you know, there's no way I had the skill set to build those 10 tab models and and really understand an institutional perspective. Um, so the first, my first, um, my right hand, my COO, he's a general counsel. He was my husband's best friend from college, actually. And <laughs> it just started. I, and I was like, really just bootstrapping in the beginning, you know, and yep. he, it started kind of like, he was wrapping up his one of his, he was an entrepreneur himself. He's wrapping up a private equity gig. And I was, I uh, was actually on that river tower deal. I was going through the process of buying out the partner and I just didn't, you know, I didn't know how to legally structure that. And, and I kept calling him and calling him and he finally was like, Hey, so like, you know, <laughs> should I just come work for you? Or like, you can't keep calling me. <laughs> and so That's I was like, funny. okay. And so I kind of took the leap with him and he's been, you know, he's amazing. He's like a, a, and he's a partner in my property management company and he's very involved in everything that happens at CA South. And then, um, and he's, you know, has a much better pedigree than I do <laughs> in terms of he went to law school and everything. And, um, and then just, you know, we, we were going at it a few, a year or two. And then we just, I mean, I started getting more and more projects and obviously the finance mine needs to come. Um, I found my VP finance and he's incredible. I mean, he went to Wharton and he was an investment banker. And like, I think that, one, it helps that one, we're in Nashville. A lot of people want to leave New York and LA and yeah. San Francisco. So you do have a lot of talent that's willing to come to Nashville. Everyone wants to be a developer. It sounds super yep. sexy. It's extremely yep. heart wrenching and difficult, but it's, you know, it's super exciting too. So, um, I think that really helps that, you know, we're a young team. I'm very entrepreneurial as, as a, you know, I don't, expect everyone to be in the office nine to five. I expect everyone to just get their work done. I mean, we work a ton, but, um, I'm not like micromanaging people and they have a lot of room to create on something. If, you know, someone came to me and was like, Hey, I think we should, you know, launch this new vertical or, you know, um, the property management is a great example. Um, Ed, the, the guy I mentioned, he was like, Hey, we're going to be having to deal with all these properties 
in um, a year. Why don't we just manage them so we can control the, you know, the experience for the end user? And I thought, okay, that's great. So, you know, he yeah. took that and wow. ran with it. So I think that sort of working environment is conducive. I do feel very, um, you know, I feel very lucky and blessed that they come, that they want to be on the team, especially <laughs> because it's so new relatively to, you know, much more secure jobs where they came from. But um, I think it's working out well. I also um, let them invest alongside of me in the deals and, you know, kind of everyone's yeah. sort of very vested. So that's been a really great way to, you know, keep our, have our little team that's grow really cool. Quickly. Yeah. yeah. So we've grown very quickly, which is exciting. Like I said, we're getting bigger office space and, um, you know, we'll probably be 10 by the end of the year or something. So. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, what about, we touched on before the interview, your, uh, your board of directors. What has that been like putting that together and how do you interface and how do you get the most out of that relationship? Yeah, that's definitely part of the team. Um, when my deals did start getting more institutional, I just inked a, you know, hundred million dollar plus deal this week, actually, which is super exciting. But Congrats. Thank you. <laughs> I know. I was just it was like <laughs> in between everything else, but oh, yeah. it was good. Um, but when I, I saw that where we were going, I knew that one, my team was young and that I didn't have that experience, a lot of experience. And I was going into different fields. I had industrial and more, you know, institutional commercial projects. And I knew that I didn't want to make any mistakes. And so you can have mentors, which is great. And I kind of encourage everyone to have a mentor you know, yeah. to start. But when we're, when you're ready, I formalized the board, um, basically by reaching out and I had some help with this, but reaching out to people that were basically later in their career, you know, they don't, they're, they're more like not semi-retired, but just they've had their success in their career. Maybe yeah. they're looking, you know, Nashville is a super exciting market. It's like, Hey, you could come to Nashville twice a year and <laughs> you know what we're doing. And, um, I just was able to get about, I think we have five or six people on the board and just kind of looking at what experiences would make a well-rounded team. And I have one woman who's incredible. She was at CIM group and she has a great, you know, she can call up institutional players hmm. if I need them. Um, I have another guy that was an attorney, the general counsel for, I think he's on his eighth uh, multifamily value add fund in New York. Um, I had a local industrial mind that weighs in on our projects as I need. And mm -hmm. I just have these brilliant people that are invested in CA South that I can call if I need, you know, to just run something by them or I'm hiring someone. Hey, can you do the last interview? Like, yeah, um, and it's amazing. just, yeah, it's like a sounding board and you know, it, it is a little bit of work. I mean, we have a board call every month or every other month and I have to, you know, I send them updates and stuff, but it's not, it's not very formal. There's no, you know, like voting or, mm -hmm. or I'm not paying everyone every month or, you know, it's not some huge overhead thing, but it, it's great because they're vested in me and they want to see me succeed and I'm able to weigh on their experiences. So it's, it's been, that's been really great. How, how did you, were those people you already knew ahead of time or did you no, have to reach just, out? And... Yeah. LinkedIn. <laughs> wow. people. Yeah. That's cold, great. Back to cold calling. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I, mean, I always, yeah, I always try to take people reach out to me now going, mm -hmm. Hey, like, can I, you know, reach, you know, can I talk yep. to you or whatever? And I always, you know, I try to with, within boundaries, like make time for that because it's, that's what, you know, that's how I got started and people gave me the time of day and, you know, even if it's 15 minutes. So, yeah, that's great. And it's great to hear that, you know, you took something from a, from a relationship and built it into you know, a, a entry, you know, a very uh, beginning stage relationship to saying, hey, you know, you're, you're building a board of directors around you that all have this amazing, they each have their own niche and their own experience. Uh, and like you said, you know, they've, they've been successful, they've seen the ins and the outs, the ups, the downs, right? Uh, and you can tap into all that and, and have a great relationship with them. Yeah. And they're, you know, most people are very, it's sort of, I mean, it's extreme in Nashville, how willing people are to help and how friendly they are. And, and, you know, it's not so much to say in New York, I mean, mm -hmm. to be honest, but 
you know, you find the right people that you mesh well with and that want to do something. But a lot of these people, if they're super successful, I mean, like, you know, they love the idea of trying to help someone younger and, you know, they're going to be able to invest in the projects and things like that. So it's yeah, great. that's really cool. Um, I want to ask about, uh, we talked about this before as well, the, your experience, uh, being a female leader, a, a developer in a, in an older male dominated industry, what has that been like for you and what kind of challenges have you overcome through that? Yeah. You know, it's been, it's been incredible. I, I, um, like being on the forefront of trying to help and inspire other women to get into commercial real estate or just entrepreneurship in general. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, I've always had a lot of guy friends. I do well with, you know, like I've, I've, I don't mind having a male team, I guess, but, um, so it hasn't been a problem. I think, especially in the South, I always get, you know, if I'm in a cocktail party with my husband, like people just assume that, you know, my husband and I work together all the time. Yeah. Or like, you know, my husband, I mean, yep. he does a totally different job, but it's like people just assume that it's my dad's company or like, I don't know. It just blows my mind. It's not so much in California, but that yeah. happens a lot in the South. It's annoying, but Hey, like I just explained to them that no. Um, so I try not and get like a chip on my shoulder about it. Mm -hmm. It can be annoying for sure, yeah. but I've never found it to impede me. And frankly, like the big checks that I've gotten written, you know, like that, if that big deal I signed, I mean, it was a $40 million check and the principal of the REIT was never made me feel like I was, hmm. you know, a young girl or yeah. anything. And so I think that's sort of what matters. And those are really the only people I answer to raise right, my investors. And they've never made me feel like it was weird. I was a girl or, or that I wasn't able or something like that. So yeah. that's always been, um, that's where I think that more women, you know, I hope, kind of take that lead and, and get into it. Um, I also, um, Sherry Deutschman is definitely a, a mentor of mine and she started a group called brain trust that helped me kind of figure out, you know, any sort of issues, but it's a, it's like a, it's an EO type approach, but for women, mm -hmm. um, like smaller women, business, women owned businesses to help them get over, you know, the million dollar hump and those type of organizations are popping up. And I think it's, and there's a lot more awareness now for, yeah. you know, creating more equality and, and, but you have to, you know, there's a balance like women, you know, there's a challenge to, if you want to be a mother, like I don't have kids yet, mm -hmm. but eventually I want to have kids, but there's a challenge to trying to be a mother and like, you and know, a full -time developer. yeah, if I'm like running, you know, I manage a private equity mm -hmm. fund and, and developing $500 million in real estate. I mean, there's a reality that mm -hmm. that's going to be more difficult. So I think, um, I've been able to navigate it so far and, you know, hopefully I will do a good job once I start a family, but I think that, um, it's possible and that, you know, I hope right. more women can do it. And going back to surrounding yourself with a great team that yeah, you, know, you can, can build help a team. Fill in. It's amazing. Like I don't, you know, I can be less and less involved the more um, capable people that I yeah. hire, and and you really can, hi you know, you can hire people that are <laughs> brilliant <laughs> to do a lot of the functions that yeah. you know you know more than me, and um you know, my main job, I mean, I'm not totally there yet, but in the next year, I think my main job will just be, you know, securing the deals and raising the capital. And that doesn't necessarily have to take a ton of time. I mean, I still, even now volunteer quite a bit and, you know, have a very balanced life. So, um, so I think it's definitely possible. Sure. And, and going back to what you said about, um, uh, encouraging more women to get into the field, what advice would you have for some of our monumental listeners that are uh, mm -hmm. women that want to get into development or, or uh, large scale commercial real estate? Um, well, if you don't want the cookie coded, coded version, then, it's, <laughs> um, then it would be that you have to control the deal or the money is kind of how you, how you, you know, make a big play into commercial real estate. I think, I mean, you don't have to, but if you want to have your own company or, or be in charge, yeah. that th those are the realities of it. And so, um, focusing on real estate finance and understanding finance, I think women have a very organized and different approach to men in terms of, um, not generally, but 
you know, I think women are extremely smart and, and have an analytical mind that's, that offers a different perspective. So if you can understand real estate finance, or at least just maybe take the CCIM courses or, um, know that aspect of it, that that is very helpful. And it kind of puts you, you know, puts you on the playing field of what the men do versus maybe Mm -hmm. marketing or, you know, a lot of other fields that I see women go into. Um, and so that would be my advice is like, understand those key things or understand how to find projects. Cause those are the things that are really, that are the, that make up the, the breadth, I guess, of development. Right. Yeah. That's great advice. I think you're right. I mean, figuring out what piece, uh, of a deal, whether the, the controlling the land or the deal itself, um, or the financing and, and understanding, fully understanding the numbers, uh, can make you tremendously valuable and can, can help you become a leader in the space by, by controlling the deal. Yeah. And it's super important, I think, to have that diversity because as I said, women do offer yeah, just agree. a lot, a much different perspective. And, and so we try to, you know, I'm trying more and more as my team grows to, ha- you know, maintain diversity for sure. Yeah, and that's a great point. That's something that's been a big part of 2021 for Holiday Ventures. And what we're doing is saying, how can we, as we're growing our team very quickly, it's how can we bring diversity in all aspects? And mm-hmm. I think female leaders is, is a great uh, opportunity for a lot of our monumental listeners saying, hey, how can how can you guys and, and how can you as a leader be more proactive and intentional about who you're bringing onto your team and building more diversity um, because I think you're exactly right. I think uh, female leaders in the real estate space, there there's not very many right now, but I think given that opportunity, they could really flourish in this field and, and be a huge asset to to your company if you're leading your company. Yeah, yeah, I would definitely agree. And I try to think about that with my team and not only with, you know, I mean, with different perspectives just so that we, you know, when you look at a development deal, there's so many facets that go into it you don't want to have a homogenous approach to what the product's going to be and you know getting perspectives from people from different places or you know it it makes a big difference so i love it um one last question then we'll dive into our monumental questions uh what is one lasting one last piece of advice that you would have for our monumental listeners wanting to break into commercial development um oh that's a that's a tough one i think (laughs) Really, uh, I always, I always say this is my big secret and I never mind sharing it because (laughs) no one ever really listens to me, but just think, I would say think big, right? Um, I can't tell you how much easier a extremely large deal is versus a $5 million deal. And so I just always encourage people to, and I really think it's just about the mental space of being able to approach something that, you know, cause I, there's people that have been better developers or I think I know some in Nashville that are just, they're better developers than I, I mean, you know, maybe they've been doing it a lot longer. They have way more construction experience or they have a lot more money contacts or they had a lot more than I started with, but they just can't conceptualize doing anything more than 10 or $15 million because it would just be like so big. And I'm telling you (laughs) that the bigger deals are easier. Yep. Yeah. I completely agree with that. Uh, it's just you amazing. Know that from like yeah. That, I mean, yeah. the, if you're doing a 10 unit deal or a 300 unit deal, it takes almost the same amount of work and the returns and the, uh, adjusted risk is a lot better on the larger scale deals. Right. Um, great chair. Uh, all right, let's jump into our monumental questions. What does success mean to you? Oh man. Um, I think success for me is, you know, I feel like I've, I've finally, I mean, you never really feel like you get there, but I think it's about creating, um, something that people want to be a part of that is helping people essentially like, Mm -hmm. you know, whether they're, you know, they can afford to live in a nice, environment and it has walkability and they're being healthier or they're maybe having a more minimalist lifestyle that's less stressful for them or you know my team that's um excited to go to work every day or our philanthropic activities i think it's really about building something that's you know lasting and that um 
that helps people essentially, and then is obviously profitable. I mean, that's always top of mind, but I think that people, you know, I've, I was very fortunate to at a very young age, be exposed to extreme wealth living in the people's homes that I was building Hmm. that were, you know, worth, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars and just seeing the misery, (laughs) to be honest, and the (laughs) level, how miserable that much money can make you if you're not giving back to your community or, you know, your church or your, you know, you're not doing something or playing a game that is worthwhile and, and creating an impact on the world that's beyond themselves. Um, and so I always keep that in mind. I've always known that um, money is great. It buys convenience. It buys you time. It buys you freedom. You know, I love being able to to have a lot more opportunity or do what I want to do because I'm not financially constrained. I mean, I am, but not, you know, not like I right. used to be. Um, and so that's important. I'm not saying money doesn't buy happiness because I do think that it can, but not, it can't. If you have, you know, a solid, your relationships are solid and you're doing the right thing and you're contributing back to your community and you're doing something more worthwhile, you know, like I really love what Mark Deutschman does with the Greenways and I Mm -hmm. want to back that and I want to make, you know, more parks or whatever it is that's important to you and whatever you're doing. Um, Otherwise, you know, what what, what is it all for? What are we doing this for? Yeah. Speaking of which, I, I love that you brought that up, uh, the impact piece. What what are some ways that you have impact or, or give back to your community? Yeah, I mean, I try to really pick and choose. So because I can I get do get asked to do a lot of different things. And I really try to, you know, on the real estate side, um, the ULI is a really great organization that I think does care a lot about those issues. Um, I sit on the board of Nashville Civic Design Center and same sort of thing, trying mm-hmm. to create more walkable spaces, trying to create better lifestyles for people in Nashville, more access to public transportation, those type of things. Um, so I love sitting on that board, great organization, the Greenways I'm involved in. Um, I volunteer at a human rights nonprofit um, quite regularly and um, just kind of pick and choose. I have a, I plan to adopt kids. So that's something with the human rights aspect that has always been very important mm. to me. So I try to spend, you know, a significant amount of time volunteering Um, and so that's kind of how I balance it. And I try to just, I would recommend, you know, choosing whatever it is. There's some great, I mean, we're the volunteer state, so it's amazing. There's a, (laughs) there's a lot of great opportunities to volunteer, but just choosing, you know, your two or three things you want to do and do those really well. Cause I, I did make the mistake in the past of trying to do everything and be involved in too many organizations and you just end up like running around at happy hours and it's not fulfilling. Yeah, exactly. So um, that's kind of how I've organized it. And COVID really actually gave me the chance to, to reprioritize those things. So I love that. Yeah. What about uh, daily habits or morning rituals that you have? So I am a weird weirdo. I get up at like 4 a.m. every day. Um, I, I do go to sleep. I'm like a granny. I go to bed at, you know, I try I try to go to bed at like 8.30 if I could. And not always, but I get up at 4, 4.30. Um, I usually, um, you know, I'm very healthy. I've been kind of doing this vegan thing lately, but um, just you know, try not and try to have my coffee. I always write down my morning goals of short, you know, what I want in the, that I'm working on now, like a deal I want to get under contract or something mm-hmm. more immediate, or, you know, I hope my husband, you know, does well at whatever venture he's working on or whatever my immediate things are happening. And then kind of more longer term, like maybe by the end of the year or in the next year, what I want to accomplish. And then ultimately, you know, where I want to be when I'm 50. Yeah. And I kind of just list those out sort of newly to put them there. Um, not every day, but a lot of mornings. And I also try to spend time before I get on my email reading. I also, um, cook a little bit in the morning. I usually make lunch, you know, lunch for Steven and, and me and try to get more with COVID again, but try to set us up to have a very healthy mm-hmm. day. So we're not just like eating out all the time. Um, and, and just give myself that space for, I don't know, an hour and a half, um, before launching the email and squawk box and all the fun, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, action exactly. items. All the- but it's great because I, Empty, my email is always empty by the time the work day starts. So when I start getting calls, usually my calendar is very programmed by nine. Mm-hmm. So from nine, it's like back to back. And so my email inbox is emptied and I'm ready to kind of 
start the day. Hmm. Yeah. Good for you. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big email uh, inbox emptier. Yeah, <laughs> I'm very yeah. adamant about that. I can't get everyone to do <laughs> I'm it. I'm still working on I that. I know. <laughs> um, so last question, favorite book or book you are currently reading? Um, so I, I'm wrapping up Atlas Shrugged for the second time. That's a good one. <laughs> I try to read that in the winter every couple of years. Um, so that's, I, I love that one. I think, um, the Gerald Hyde one was definitely one of my favorite. And then I just finished how I built this by, um, oh, Guy Raz from oh, yeah. NPR. Mm-hmm. It's his podcast I listened to. So I just finished that. That was an amazing book with entrepreneurship. So I, I would recommend that one. Um, I think of all time, it'd have to be Atlas Shrugged, but. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Uh, those are three great books. Um, so Meg, thank you so much for being on the podcast and the show. Uh, I know I had a blast. I'm sure everybody watching and Thanks listening so much. I really probably it. absolutely loved everything that, that you shared today. Um, where can our monumental listeners follow you or reach out to you? Sure. Um, I, my LinkedIn, I, I do my assistant goes through my LinkedIn messages. Um, my assistant's email is assistant at CA South Development. So if you have anything that's pertinent that, you know, you want to reach me for, you can email, um, you can email me or yeah, LinkedIn is good. I love it. Guys, yeah. check Meg out on LinkedIn. Uh, she is doing some amazing things and CA South Development, check out their website. Uh, and guys, do not forget if you enjoyed today's episode, if you enjoyed Meg's show, uh, make sure to share it. And make sure to share it with friends, share it on social media, share it on LinkedIn especially, and tag Mag, tag myself, let us know you're listening. Uh, And guys, with that, have a monumental day. Mm -hmm.